Hi, uh, thanks for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Arthur Day. I'm one of the neurosurgeons at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston uh, that practices at the Memorial Hermann uh, uh, Texas Medical Center. Today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a specific entity called a uh, pituitary tumor and uh, try to carry you through uh, what these things are and, uh, and what the current state of uh, the treatment is uh, when they do need some aggressive intervention, such as, uh, such as an operation. Now, a pituitary tumor is a type of a brain tumor. Brain tumors are, by definition, things that grow inside the brain or inside the skull next to the brain. Now, because the skull is a round box that has a certain space in them, then whenever anything grows in that space, there can be a point where the pressure sp starts to go up in the head. So signs of a brain tumor when pressure starts to go up are things like headache or nausea or vomiting, papilledema, which means swelling of the back of the eye, and eventually if pressure gets too high, the person will start to have a declining level of consciousness. On the other hand, some brain tumors start producing symptoms before they get so big that the pressure goes up. Symptoms a brain tumor can cause are things like seizures or some sort of uh, specific weakness or numbness of an arm or a leg, personality changes, and in the case of pituitary tumors, they can start making changes in the way the hormones are produced by the brain. This is a picture on your right showing the skull, as I've outlined it here, with this arrow, and you can see uh, as the arrow, here's the skull, and the brain tumor can arise from the coverings of the brain, from the brain itself, from cavities inside the brain, and the pituitary gland is this little thing sitting there right at the base of the skull, right between the eyeballs, and a flat plane of bone called the skull base, at the end of the skull base, right in that particular area there. Now, when a brain tumor starts, the brain tumor may originate from something that's naturally there already, like in this case, the brain itself or those coverings I was just speaking of, or it can be called a secondary tumor, meaning it started somewhere else in the body, like in the lungs or the breast or somewhere else, and spreads to the, to the brain, to the bloodstream. So a pituitary tumor then is a primary brain tumor that starts at the base of the skull. It is not a secondary tumor and it does not spread to other organs as it grows. Now when you uh, also look further at brain tumors, then brain tumors can be divided into those that start within the brain substance itself, as I've used for the arrow here, the uh, right in this brain tissue substance here, or it can arise from something on the surface of the brain and then dense into the brain. The, the types of those kind of tumors would be the wrappings of the brain, which are called the meninges, and the tumor of the meninges is called a meningioma, or a tumor of the nerves that are leaving the brain, and the nerves come out usually down here at the base of the skull and leave through the skull to go to the eyes or the ears various things that the nerves do around the head, or from the pituitary gland itself, that region right in there, not inside the actual brain substance, but within, the, but underneath the brain substance, and of course as it grows, it can grow up in towards the brain and deform the brain. So primary brain tumors are not as uh, are, are outlined here in terms of the numbers or distribution of tumors. And the most common brain tumor is a tumor that arises within the brain substance. But we're talking about one of the four. So primary brain tumors are not as tumor of the meninges is called a meningioma, or a tumor of the nerves that are leaving the brain nerves come out usually down here at the base of the skull and leave through the skull to go to the eyes or the ears, various things that the nerves do around the head, or from the pituitary gland itself, that region right in there, not inside the actual brain substance, but within, the, but underneath the brain substance, 
And of course, as it grows, it can grow up in towards the brain and deform the brain. So primary brain tumors are not as uh, are, are outlined here in terms of the numbers or distribution of tumors. And the most common brain tumor is a tumor that arises within the brain substance. But we're talking about one of the four most common types of primary brain tumors, and that's pituitary tumors. And as you see in an older surgical series, it does account for about five or 10 percent of, of brain tumors that ultimately come to surgery. It's actually though much more common, many of these brain tumors of pituitary type do not need surgery, but yet they're much more frequent than this table would outline. So it is a very common clinical condition. Now, where is the pituitary gland? Well, the picture on the skull shows that it's right in the very center of the head in this bony divot right here. The frontal lobes are up at the top of the bone the skull that you see, and the back of the head is at the bottom of the screen, and the temporal or the temporal lobes are off to each side. So the pituitary gland sits in the pocket of bone that's right in the very center of the head. Now, if you then add the wrappings of the bone, the, called the meninges, and you put the arteries in and part of the brain, you can see that it's right in the middle of some very important structures. Right next to here, I'm outlining now in the green arrow is the optic nerves that come from the eyes. The eyes would be in this particular region over here, and the nerves then come from the back of the eyes to enter the brain. So the pituitary gland is sitting right underneath where the optic nerves are coming into the head. On either side of the pituitary gland are the carotid arteries that go to supply most of the blood to the brain. And behind the pituitary gland is the part of the brain called the brain stem, which controls many of the vital functions that your body needs to stay alive. So the pituitary gland is right in the middle of everything important going on. Now, uh, as we go through this process then, uh, to understand where it is, the pituitary gland is underneath the skull, as we talked about. So the pituitary gland lives in a small pocket of bone underneath, and it then does its business. But on occasion, if a tumor is in that particular area, it may grow out of its normal little box up towards the brain and deform those things that we just outlined. The pituitary gland then is a part of a system of which hormones are made in the body. So this is the composite of the system of which the pituitary is one part of. So the pituitary gland, I've, I've used the arrow now to, and, and shown a box here, I did a blow up of this particular area at the base of the skull and did an uh, abstract of this to show the component parts of how the pituitary gland works. First, there's a part in the base of the brain called the hypothalamus, which drives all the, the, uh, the, the stimulations for making uh, the pituitary gland work. It then runs down through a stalk, all the connections from the hypothalamus into the actual gland itself, which is buried in that little pocket of bone. Now the hypothalamus, the part up here in the, in the brain itself is responsible for keeping the environment of the brain and the body normal and stable. It's also something where, where when you get excited, you get stimulation there to keep you, make you able to run fast. The epinephrine system, the excitatory system of the brain is located in that area. And it sort of keeps us running without us having to think about it. So the things that the hypothalamus does to keep us surviving is we can make sure we eat. When we're hungry, we eat appropriately, that we drink appropriately, we keep a normal body temperature, our, our drives for sexual procreation, for emotion, for night-day cycles are, are all parts of this process that the hypothalamus does. But number seven is outlines its relationship to the pituitary gland 
and that is that it generates factors or releasing factors when it sees changes that need to happen to tell the pituitary to, uh, the gland to make hormones. So if you're in a, a, a time in your young age to grow, it says release some growth hormones so you'll get bigger, something of that nature. Now, when you then follow the pituitary stalk down and get actually to the pituitary gland, you'll see the pituitary gland has two portions. It has a front portion called the anterior lobe, which makes most of the hormones, and it has an ant a posterior portion, which actually is a direct extension of the brain itself down into that area where the pituitary gland sits. So this posterior lobe and the anterior lobe come from different places and fuse as you're growing, as you're expanding as an embryo. This part came from the mouth, from the bottom up into the head. This part came from the brain as it stuck down and the two of them fused along a line here. Now this particular front part of the brain, the, an uh, the pituitary, the anterior lobe is where most of the hormones are made. They're told to make it by a message coming from the hypothalamus, and then the anterior lobe makes the hormones. And the hormones include things like growth hormone, which makes you grow until you go through puberty, prolactin, which prepares the female particularly for getting, uh, having their menstrual cycles and for getting ready to have a baby. There are other hormones for uh, development of the, the, the uh, ovaries and testes to, to do their business for, for fertilization. It overregulates the thyroid gland and it secretes the hormone that controls a body's internal cortisone called ACTH. So these all are the regulatory uh, proteins secreted by the pituitary gland to keep your body working right. The first two, oxytocin and vasopressin, are hormones that are actually produced in the hypothalamus and are stored down here in the posterior thing gland. So the first two are posterior gland, the others are all anterior gland, and oxytocin and vasopressin are responsible for making you thirsty and drinking and controlling the concentration of your urine. Very important to keep you from getting over overhydrated or dehydrated. So you, when you put them all together and you put them in the, in the parts of where the pituitary gland sits, you can sort of figure out what kind of problems a pituitary tumor might do if it's present. First, it might produce mass. This pituitary gland might grow big, and as it does, it may start growing out of where it is up towards the brain. It may make the little box that it lives in so tight that the whole gland starts to fail because it's just too squeezed, in which case, your pituitary function will go down. It may grow up and then hit the areas of the visual system, the optic nerves are crossing right in this area. So you may start losing vision. And it may grow up even further to fill the space of where the hypothalamus is and block spinal fluid from, from circulating, a condition then develops called hydrocephalus, which can make pressure go up in the head and make a person lose their mental function. On the other hand, the gland itself, since it produces so much of these important hormones, can actually secrete too much of the hormone while the tumor is small. So you can get conditions in the body in which too much hormone is produced, and that can disturb a person's ability to be fertile, it can make them grow in, an, in a very specific way or develop several other conditions that we're going to talk about in a minute. So the two types of pituitary tumor presentations are those related to the tumor getting big enough to press on things nearby and those that are related to specific hormones created by the tumor. Now the tumor, that once one gets one, can also be judged according to size. A microadenoma is a tumor, like shown over here, that is small in the pituitary gland, that little dark area is the tumor. And a microadenoma is less than a centimeter. On the other hand, as the tumor gets bigger, as is shown over here, 
It becomes bigger than a centimeter, and now you can see it's filled up the space where the gland originated and is now growing up into the brain and hitting the optic nerves and starting to stretch it. So if you have a pituitary tumor, one of the first questions you would consider would be, is my tumor small or large? Once it gets to be large, then it starts to bring in a whole bunch of other possibilities about what could happen. This is a CAT scan in the upper left of what a big pituitary tumor looks like. Very clear right there in the middle of the head. And of course, this picture down to the left is an autopsy specimen of a person with a tumor shown in the green arrow. And you can see just to the left and the right of them, this is the markedly stretched optic nerves coming out in a person that was nearly blind before they died with this tumor. When one does get stretching of the optic nerves, the typical visual pattern of loss is losing the outside of your peripheral fields. So this is an, a picture of what a person would see, what their vision would look like if they had a pituitary tumor. They, as you can see, would see nothing on the outside of their vision in either eye. They can see the center of vision on the left eye and the center of vision on the right eye but they can't see the outside or they can't see the outside of either eye. So this is a person who might not be safe to drive because they wouldn't see the car next to them, but they could certainly see what was straight ahead. Now going back to our outline of how these tumors present, Again, I've sort of outlined where the tumor is originating from in this little box. The name of the box is called the cella or the cella tersica. I'm outlining the floor of the bone of that, and it's cella tersica literally means Turkish saddle. So it sort of struck the early anatomist as something that looks like the kind of saddle that they used to write, uh, 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 you know, describe in, in, in all the uh, romantic Arabian of movies, and then it's got a lid to it, a lid of dura mater called the diaphragm or the diaphragma cella. And of course, at the bottom, it's in, it projects itself into an open space at the base of the skull called the sphenoid sinus. So when we talk about how to get into this tumor to treat it, we first of all want to know, is it bigger than the space it was supposed to be in? Is it growing up or is it growing down? So let's first look and see what mass-related, uh, we've already talked about mass-related symptoms, but let's now talk about the specific hormonal syndromes of what can happen if you have a small or a large tumor that's making too much of a specific hormone and that you're getting now the clinical effects of that hormone. The first condition is if you make too much growth hormone. If you make growth hormone excessively, and you haven't gone through pu puberty, then you become a giant. You will be very tall and potentially could play in an NBA as a basketball player. This is a normal sized man, a famous neurosurgeon named Harvey Cushing, who did some famous outlining of, of the kinds of pituitary tumors there were. And this is one of his famous patients, and you can see it's clearly a foot, almost a foot and a half taller than Harvey Cushing. And I believe Harvey Cushing was somewhere around 5'9", 5'11", something of that nature. So too much growth hormone, if you get it when you're a child, makes you really tall. It also, on the other hand, regardless of your age, has a profound effect on other organs in the, in the uh, body, and leads to conditions that dramatically shorten life expectancy. It causes high blood pressure, cardiac disease, diabetes, excess hair and, and sweating, your organs actually get bigger and you get pigmented in various ways. You get some various, very characteristic facial features, which you're going to see in that movie star who plays in all the James Bond movies called Jaws. He has a condition called acromegaly, which makes his face look a certain size. Uh, and, and we're going to see what that looks like up close. Acromegaly refers to the way the hands are shaped 
but it does give characteristic facial features. A person then who has growth hormone excess is in danger of having a much shortened life because of all of these conditions that are, are side effects of too much growth hormone. One of the things they do as they get this condition is they develop a very prominent jaw feature, and you can see this very prominent jaw on this early Harvey Cushion patient. They also get uh, what's called acromegaly, in which their fingers get a, a, a specific kind of a shape with the thickening of the, the in, ends of the fingers and they get marked increased folding in the uh, in the scalp and, and their whole soft tissue appearance becomes changed. So many of these people will look very similar to each other because the soft tissues around the face get big in the same way on every single person so they look almost like they're related. Now a second condition that comes about from too much of a certain hormone is called Cushing's disease after Harvey Cushing that I just described. Cushing's disease means too much cortisone or ACTH produced by the, by the brain. And that produces very specific facial features. As you see the redness of the cheek and the swelling and these striations or, uh, and, and abdominal protuberance uh, which are characteristic of this condition. So a person with Cushing's disease has too much ACTH from the pituitary gland and they get all these side effects of high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, and very, very specific uh, physical characteristics. Again, life shortening, so a good indication for treatment. Now prolactin is the, is the, the, the hormone that, that regulates fertility and breast milk secretion. So women who may are particularly affected when they have a pituitary tumor that develops too much prolactin because they get irregularities of their menstrual cycles and of course they are infertile. They're not able to, uh, to get pregnant because the, the hormonal alterations there become favorable for getting the uterus ready to have a uh, to have a successful reduction of pregnancy. There are also some very much uh, significant effects to uh, males as well if they get too much uh, prolactin. So uh, this condition uh, uh, is also a manifestation of a pituitary tumor being too active and producing too much hormone. A final one would be if there's uh, some problem with the, the control of this of this, tum this hormone called oxytocin or vasopressin, which are produced up here in the hypothalamus, but then come down and are stored in the gland down here. This hormone is necessary for you to concentrate your urine, and if you were to get a mass in your pituitary gland that made this posterior gland not work, or a mass anywhere along the hypothalamus or the pituitary stalk that made the body not be able to make enough, di enough vasopressin, then you would be unable to control your urine and you would make large amounts of urine and would become rapidly dehydrated. Your sodium would go way up and you would then get a remarkable change in the brain swelling and your neurologic function and potentially die because of electrolyte ab abnormality. We call that condition because it affects the amount of urine, diabetes, like diabetes mellitus, which means sweet urine. This is diabetes insipidus, which means a lot of urine or the thin urine. Now, when you have a pituitary tumor, there are four components of the treatment team. There's an endocrinologist who knows a lot about the hormones and hopefully can get your medical condition under control an ophthalmologist who looks at the visual manifestations of what, what's going on with a person, potentially a radiation therapist if there's a, a possibility that, that radiation might be used as a treatment. But a neurosurgeon in general is the person who looks at these and decides on an individual patient what might be the best kind of treatment if something besides medical treatment is necessary. 
because invariably the kinds of treatment of, of, of surgical nature are going to be under the direction of a neurosurgeon. These are the treatment options. They would include medical therapy, radiation, and surgery, as we talked about. But we're going to mainly focus on the surgical me methods of treatment. If you are, if you do have a pituitary tumor, and you're going to think about having an operation. Now, because of the location of where the pituitary gland is, it's at the base of the skull, as we talked about. It's situated right under here in this area right here. Right in front of it and below it is an open space in the skull called the sphenoid sinus. So the hallmark of an operation to get to the pituitary gland is to go in through the nose or above the lip, build a tunnel along the, uh, that path, get into the sphenoid sinus, and then go right to the pituitary gland. So the basic treatment of when you need treatment surgically is to go through the trans. Uh, through the sphenoid or transphenoidal to get to the pituitary gland to open it up from the bottom so you don't have to go through the brain. Now this picture on the bottom left shows our view. The pituitary gland is sitting there right in the middle. It's not very big and on either side is the carotid artery on either side you can, and it, there's also a large vein called the cavernous sinus and there are many nerves to the further outside that go and control the face and the eyes. So this is a tight spot. And if you're going on this picture over here, this little bitty area here needs some magnification and lots of good light to be able to treat the things without hurting the adjacent important structures. There are two methods of seeing this area well. One's called the microscopic microsurgical method in which we put that speculum, the black thing seen on the picture on the left, into the nose and hold it open and use a standard surgical microscope to see. That lets the neurosurgeon use two hands so it can be both hands in the field and it really gives great visualization and, and uh, lets us use our instruments that we normally would use. But it only limits what we can see right down the tube. So we can't see off to the side because we're looking only down that tube. There are now ways that we can combine a microscopic operation with an endoscopic procedure, much like the knee surgeons do when they do arthroscopy. And when they do that, they can look sideways and go in and look around the corner with various angles of their arthroscopy, just like the knee surgeon does. It then gives a significantly wider view, but on the other hand, it goes in through one nostril while you're working through the other. And so you don't, it's harder to work with two hands when one hand is holding the endoscope. And of course, its dimension of vision is not nearly as good as a microscope in terms of 3D uh, visualization. But yet the technology now for most of uh, 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 transphenoidal procedures that the surgeon selects which one of these would be the best for a particular case. And, and would be familiar with how to use them both. Now, when you have a pituitary tumor, this picture uh, shows you the uh, other things that we have to consider to make sure it's a pituitary tumor. The fact is the optic nerves is shown on the left, the carotid artery and the brain stem and the brain are all nearby. So they could all grow into other kinds of things that look like tumors, but aren't. So, and since they're so close to the pituitary gland, they could affect the pituitary function, or they could look like a pituitary tumor but actually be coming from somewhere else. So there are various cysts that can occur in, within the pituitary gland itself. As I told you there on the film on the bottom right in the picture, there is this merger zone between the front and back portion of the pituitary gland. And you can get cysts within that merger zone, which we call Rathke's cleft cysts. You can also get inflammation of that, of, of the pituitary stalk. A tumor that arises along this area, especially up high, is called a cranioparyngioma, where the merger of the cranial portion, which is this portion that came down from the brain, and the merger of the pharyngeal or the throat portion, again, lets a capture of trapping of some cells from the uh, merger as, a, as an embryo. That grow into a tumor called the cranial pharyngioma. 
we're going to look at the other kinds of tumors, meningiomas, aneurysms, and gliomas that may mimic a pituitary tumor, all of which a neurosurgeon has to be familiar with to make sure that he's dealing with a pituitary tumor and not something else. Now, this is what a craniopharyngioma would look like. It, as I said, uh, uh, comes about from the junctional zone, the merger zone of the front and the back lobe of the pituitary. And so it's not down in here on this picture where the pituitary gland is. It's coming from the stalk above, and now it's originating actually inside the head. So it turns out to be a common tumor in childhood, but another peak of, of, of occurrence is in the uh, middle-aged adult, and it usually is something that uh, will require surgery as it grows because it can interfere with the pituitary stalk and the connections between the brain, the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland itself. As it gets bigger, obviously, it grows into much bigger spaces and deforms, and as it gets, when it gets too big, it no longer is possible to even consider going through the transphenoidal route. And so that's a condition that we would have to go through the brain by doing a craniotomy to be able to get to it, uh, or through the head, not through the brain, to be able to get it out. Meningiomas, we've referred to a little bit, uh, are tumors that grow from the coverings of the brain, the meninges. So anytime we see, as on this picture on the left, along the inner lining of a skull bone, it is possible that that inner lining covering of the meninges will grow into a tumor. So frequent spots of tumors called meningiomas are right next to the pituitary gland. This is the pituitary gland where the arrow is here or right in front of the pituitary gland on this side view. Those areas referred to as a sphenoid ridge meningioma or a tuberculum cell meningioma are two common meningiomas that occur close enough to, to the pituitary gland and also affect vision that they must be uh, eliminated from your differential diagnosis. They're more common in women and they may have secondary effects on either the pituitary system or the visual system. Obviously, as they get bigger, they can grow, and just like pituitary tumors can cause marked mass effect, the patient can get progressive uh, uh, changes in their mental status and their judgment as they uh, vision as they get bigger, like pituitary tumors. Another condition, because as we uh, outlined, the proximity of the of the uh, carotid arteries of the pituitary is a person can get an aneurysm of the carotid arteries that can affect the pituitary gland that sits right between the two carotid arteries. This is an example of a, of a CAT scan showing an, an aneurysm that looks almost identical to that picture we showed earlier that looked like a pituitary tumor. And yet when you open uh, or inject dye into the brain through a test called an arteriogram, we can see the filling of the artery in the big bubble or balloon full of dye called an aneurysm. Here's a small aneurysm on another arteriogram besides the, uh, the, the, the uh, pituitary gland, and here's an actual picture of what an aneurysm looks like coming off a normal carotid artery right next to the optic nerve on this picture. So obviously if we thought we had a pituitary tumor and we went in and opened up the sphenoid sinus and went into the base of the skull and we didn't realize there was an aneurysm and if we, uh, we opened up the, the tumor to try to take it out and it was an aneurysm then there would be a massive amount of bleeding and a very catastrophic possible outcome. So we have to know that this is not the cause of your tumor, an aneurysm. We have to make sure we distinguish between aneurysms and tumors. Here's a tumor of the same type that grew to giant proportions, so it's actually acting like a tumor. And here's what the tumor looks like by going into the operation. It looks like a rock. As we take away the base of the skull, the artery and the rock can be separated and we clip that aneurysm and the end result in a person losing vision, gaining back much of their vision by getting the aneurysm repaired. 
So I've carried you through a few of the details of what a pituitary tumor looks like, where it is in the skull, and what it can do to you, and what the considerations are as you're looking through the, 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 the various x-rays and the clinical manifestations of this region. It's a very fascinating region that uh, brings in a lot of specialists uh, into play. Once it reaches the point of causing enough mass effect or or is not responding to medicines where the side effects of too much hormone will start to affect a person's life, then we consider interventions. The standard intervention, the best treatment for most people, is, a, is an operation called a transsynoidal pituitary tumor removal. That's usually done with a combination of microsurgical and endoscopic uh, uh, visualization removal. On some occasions, or if the tumor is not a pituitary tumor, but is mimicking a pituitary tumor, then we actually open the skull, do a craniotomy, and go into the front part of the skull, and can do that without leaving traces on the brain. That approach through the anterior skull base by opening the skull and lifting up the brain from the skull base is called an anterior skull base approach. When we have vascular lesions or aneurysms, the modern treatments of many of these aneurysms can be done through the arterial system in the groin. So endovascular treatments to fix aneurysms or to control bleeding from or, or, or the blood supply to various tumors are done by an endovascular surgeon. Uh, so that needs to be part of the multidisciplinary team. And of course, on occasion, these tumors have extended to places or need to be treated with radiation therapy to reduce their, their chance of causing continued problems, in which we use focused radiation called radiosurgery and either radiation, the physicists and radiation, the therapist that are involved in the team. So I wanted to thank you all for uh, letting me share some of this information with you today. And uh, uh, I, uh, if you need any more information uh, about this uh, topic, uh, we'll be happy to respond. You can get in touch with us at the Nisher Nerve.